Good morning. Thank you all for being here. This hearing will now come to order. Uh, during the 70s, a dedicated group of programmers and clinicians began a healthcare transformation as they built what would become the Veterans Health Information Systems and Technology Architecture, or what we know as VISTA. It was the beginning of an age of personal computer, and these IT pioneers saw the potential for bringing computing power to the healthcare space. The Department of Veterans Affairs was an early innovator and adopter of the electronic medical record and established itself as a healthcare leader a leader in healthcare IT. Today, we have clinicians and researchers across VA using IT tools and powerful health data to improve care and find medical breakthroughs. However, the VA is at a technology crossroads, and what began as a guerrilla IT project has sprawled into a massive decentralized system in an archaic coding language. And within the IV, uh, uh, VA, there are at least 130 versions or instances of VISTA across 1,500 sites. No version is the same, and the system connects to various applications and devices through interfaces. VISTA serves many offices, programs, staff, and veterans, but it has surpassed its technology lifespan. VA has struggled to modernize VISTA and past attempts to replace it or update it have not been successful. And now the VA is pursuing an approach with the acquisition of a commercial electronic health record system. However, the transition from one system to another is not a simple matter of just flipping the switch. It's a painstaking process that you all are aware of and that involves technical challenges as well as policy changes. There are many st stakeholders who want to understand the impacts of the transition and how their equities in VISTA will be affected. VA has told the subcommittee that there's a plan in draft to address both the technical and policy side of the transition from VISTA to Cerner's electronic health record, but that plan is not expected to be completed until the fall of 2019. This plan will require the concurrence of the Office of Information and Technology, the Veterans Health Administration, and the Office of Electronic Health Record Modernization. There are many unknowns in this transition. It's important that the VA's strategy be well-timed to identify who, those unknowns and to mitigate potential disruptions to the healthcare and research. The fact that this plan is still being formulated is concerning. Further, as the Government Accountability Office will discuss today, the VA does not yet have a reliable accounting of all the costs associated with VISTA management, and there is still ongoing work to understand all of the instances of VISTA and to define them. We also need the VA to arrive at a transparent and accountable decision as to what VISTA management will mean going forward so that there are not gaps in care, that valuable research is not disrupted, and that expectations are established and met. VISTA cannot remain a static system over the 10 years that EHRM implementation will take, and additionally, at least 40% of VISTA will not be in Cerner. And this subcommittee would like more information how VA will manage those functionalities and potentially modernize them in the future. We think there's opportunities for VA to be forward thinking in the transition and to harness the innovative approach that drove the creation of VISTA. The pilot to move instances of VISTA to the cloud has potential, but we need more information to understand its feasibility from a cost and impact perspective. At minimum, we need to maintain the leg legacy system until it has been fully replaced or moderni modernized but if there are potential efficiencies and in healthcare innovations to be gained, we should identify them and also consider those opportunities. I thank all of the witnesses for being here today and look forward to your testimony. And I now uh, would like to recognize my colleague, Ranking Member uh, Banks, for five minutes to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is no longer possible to talk about VISTA without discussing Cerner and vice versa. 
Although the goal of VA's electronic health record modernization is to replace VISTA and CPRS, these legacy systems will exist alongside Cerner for at least the next nine years. That means they have to interoperate. This mixed environment will be extremely challenging in which some medical centers will still use VISTA while others use the Cerner EHR. Up until now, the subcommittee has focused on the total cost of ownership of VISTA versus the total cost of implementing and operating Cerner. I still believe that is an important question and one we have yet to receive a satisfactory answer to. But the complexity of the mixed environment is the biggest difficulty confronting VA. Some key questions are, how will the Cerner data flow back into VISTA? How will scheduling information be integrated across the two environments? Will referrals be transmitted uniformly in both systems? And how will different data be aggregated for reporting and analysis? We are still in the middle of the beginning of the EHRM overall, but VA is nearing the end of its planned design and configuration process. In other words, the rubber is hitting the road. With the Mission Act implementation deadline behind us, the Veteran Health, Veterans Health Administration and the Office of Information Technology appear to be reallocating personnel and executive attention to EHRM, and that is very good news. VA just completed the sixth of eight National Workflow Council meetings. New technical obstacles are being identified, especially with the data migration into Cerner and interoperability in this mixed environment. At the outset of EHRM, the team made ambitious promises to migrate substantially more patient data into Cerner than DOD determined was feasible in MHS Genesis. That optimistic plan seems to have run into technical difficulties. This is not a foregone conclusion, and there may be good reasons why. I hope to get explanations for that this morning. Relatedly, Cerner's healthy intent population health software seems to have morphed from a vehicle for feeding data into the Millennium EHR to another repository of patient data that clinicians may have to access alongside Millennium. Without a doubt, snags like this are inevitable in a project of this magnitude. The timeline is getting tight, but the important thing is that constraints are acknowledged and any trade-offs that must be made to resolve them are presented transparently. On the other hand, everyone in VA always expected that creating the system interfaces between Vista and Cerner would be a tall order. There are 73 different groups of interfaces ranging in size and difficulty. I am glad to see OIT assign more personnel, including some of their very best people, to this effort. I want to know how this work is being organized and whether it is being approached in a manner that will reduce rather than add complexity in the mixed environment. I am skeptical, though, that all the technical constraints are known and there aren't more intractable difficulties waiting to be discovered. Um, as we pass through September and the end of the plan design and configuration process for EHRM, VA may be presented with a choice, a choice to take the system live more quickly with initial, some would say limited sets of capabilities, or proceed more gradually with a complete set of capabilities. I expect that decision to be made in VHA based on input from the affected medical centers. And I will support the decision wholeheartedly if I believe it is made for the right decisions. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. I'd now like to introduce the witnesses we have before the subcommittee today. Dr. Paul Tibbetts is the Executive Director of the Office of Technical Integration within the Office of Information and Technology at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Dr. Tippetts is accompanied by Charles Hume, Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Health for the Office of Health uh, Informatics, and Dr. Thomas O'Toole, who is a senior medical advisor both within the Veterans Health Administration as well as uh, John Short, Chief Technology and Integration Officer in the Office of Electronic Health Record Modernization. 
I'd also like to introduce Carol Harris, who is the Director of Information Technology Acquisition Management at the Government Accountability Office. We will now hear the uh, prepared statements from our panel members. Your written statements in full will be included in the hearing record. And without objection, uh, Dr. Tibbetts, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Lee, Ranking Member Banks, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today <clears throat> about the Department of Veterans Affairs IT modernization effort, efforts, including the electronic health record modernization, and the uh, and Vista also uh, uh, our, the program you mentioned earlier. Uh, the Office of Information and Technology pioneered Vista to support the clinical, administrative, and financial operations of the Veterans Health Administration. Since its creation, Vista has evolved into an enterprise planning tool used multiple VA uh, and, uh, by multiple VA administrations. Today, Vista supports over 150 applications and the operations of more than uh, 1,500 VA clinics and VA medical centers. <clears throat> there are 130 unique instances of VISTA nationwide that share core functionality but are customized to each VAMC's needs and populations. VISTA has served VA and veterans for over 40 years, but it does not possess the modern capabilities that medical providers and veterans deserve. VISTA's required uh, critical upgrades alone could cost several billion dollars over the years and maintenance costs are higher. It is not interoperable with the Department of Defense, which keeps uh, the health information of service members and future veterans. Instead, VA staff must use separate viewers to see the DOD data. In May of 2018, a VA awarded Cerner a contract to replace VISTA with Cerner Millennium, a commercial off-the-shelf solution currently deployed by the Department of Defense. VA is working with Cerner to achieve initial operating capability and deploy Cerner Millennium beginning in spring of 2020 in the Pacific Northwest. As the nationwide Cerner rollout progresses, VA will decommission VISTA instances as necessary. However, uh, during the transition period, VA must maintain VISTA to ensure current patient record accessibility and continued delivery of quality care. Uh, the cost of sustainment, GAO's report uh, projects a VA will spend $426 million to sustain VISTA in fiscal year 29, 2019. <clears throat> VA is currently developing a methodology to update the cost data and thereby define VISTA, a recommendation in the GAO report. We expect VISTA to run without service degradation until all VAMCs are running in the new electronic health record solution. Sustainment cost during the transition include development of, uh, for new capability and interfaces, congressional mandates, maintenance, and other costs. The estimated minimum cost for VISTA uh, during the 10-year transition period is $4.89 billion, excluding any new required development. Our long-term strategy, VA is leveraging more efficient means of sustainment, including uh, OINT's shift to a development and operations approach that uh, develops, enhances, maintains, and rolls out better products more quickly. VAMCs will be required to run the nationally released gold version of VISTA, creating a common set of software routines where possible. OINT follows VHA's guidance on needed patches and upgrades to VISTA. These will continue as normal throughout the rollout of uh, Cerner. The newly formed Office of Technical Integration facilitates communication and planning between program offices that are implementing the system, the systems to replace VISTA. OINT is currently piloting a program to migrate all 130 instances of VISTA to the cloud. In conclusion, until the new electronic health record solution is implemented across the VA enterprise, VISTA remains VA's authoritative source of veteran data. Sustaining VISTA for the duration of the electronic health record modernization ensures that VA continues to provide uninter uninterrupted care and services. Uh, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss OINT's progress towards VISTA transition. I look forward to continuing to work with the subcommittee to address our greatest priorities. This concludes my testimony, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, now, Ms. Harris. Thank you. Chair Lee, Ranking Member Banks, and members of the subcommittee, 
Thank you for inviting us to testify today on VA's health information system, referred to as VISTA. As requested, I'll briefly summarize the findings from our report on this very mission critical system. VA provides healthcare services to roughly 9 million veterans and their families and relies on VISTA to do so. However, the system is over 30 years old, is costly to maintain, and does not fully support exchanging health data with DOD and private healthcare providers. As such, VA has work underway to replace the system with a commercial one. However, the department plans to continue using VISTA during its decade-long transition to the new system. This morning, I'd like to highlight three key points from our report. First, VA lacks a comprehensive definition of VISTA, but additional work is planned that could address the gaps. To maintain internal control activities over an IT system and its related infrastructure, organizations should be able to define the physical and performance characteristics of the system, as well as the environment in which it operates. VA maintains multiple documents and a database that describes parts of VISTA. It has also conducted multiple analyses to better understand customization of the system components at various medical facilities. Yet, the existing information in aggregate does not provide a thorough understanding of the local customizations reflected in about 130 versions of VISTA that support healthcare delivery at more than 1,500 sites. According to program officials, the decentralization of VISTA's development is a reason why they have not been able to fully define it. Cerner's contract to provide the new electronic health record system calls for the company to conduct comprehensive assessments to identify site-specific requirements where its system is to be deployed. Three site assessments have been completed thus far, and additional ones are planned. If these assessments provide a complete understanding of the 130 VISTA versions, the department should be able to define VISTA and be better positioned to transition to the new system. Now my second point. VA believes VISTA has cost $2.3 billion between 2015 and 2017, but this fig figure is neither reliable nor comprehensive. VA can only reliably account for $1 billion of the $2.3 billion total. The source data for the remaining $1.3 billion, which largely accounted for VISTA's infrastructure, related software, and personnel costs were not well documented. As a result, VA's subject matter experts were unclear on how to account for VISTA versus non-VISTA costs. Furthermore, the department omitted costs related to additional hosting and data standardization and testing from the total spend. Given these issues, the department is not in a position to accurately report annual costs to develop and sustain VISTA. As such, VA lacks reliable information needed to make critical management decisions for sustaining the many versions of VISTA over the next 10 years until Cerner is fully deployed. My third point, VA has initiated a number of activities to transition from VISTA to the Cerner system. Among other things, VA has taken steps to establish and staff a program office, as well as form a governance structure the department's actions in these critical areas are ongoing. Furthermore, additional actions are in progress to address our recommendations from September 2018 to clearly define the role and responsibilities of the joint DOD and VA interagency program office. As the department continues to work toward acquiring a new electronic health record, it will be important for VA to fully implement the recommendation we made in our report for improving the reporting of VISTA costs. <coughs> Doing so is essential to helping ensure that decisions related to the current system are informed by reliable cost information. That concludes my statement, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you. I'd now uh, like to recognize myself for five minutes to ask questions, and I'll first start with Ms. Harris. Um, in your report, you just uh, stated that the VA identified $2.3 billion in VISTA costs uh, between 2015 and 2017, yet uh, only um, uh, the VA couldn't uh, demonstrate reliability on uh, 1.3 billion of that uh, alleged VISTA expenses. Can you explain the significance of um, what that lack of reliability means? Sure. Um Chair Lee, uh, more than half of VA's reported 2.3 billion costs couldn't be verified based on the source data that we looked at in our review. And this is of concern because 
without reliable information, VA will not be in a position to make critical management decisions about the system, and the system will be sustained for the for the next ten years. So that that's the major problem. In in your uh, opinion, based on your past work with VA, do you expect the actual Vista related cost to be more or less than the two point three billion? It will likely be more than the two point three billion because VA has omitted key costs from from that 2.3 initial estimate that they provided to us, things like additional hosting as one example. Um, and, and just as an example of that, with the additional hosting, um, last June VA told us the cost for this particular line item was about $238 million per year. Shortly thereafter, they told us that the cost was actually $950 million. And in the end, they reported $0 for, um, per year. And so when we talked to VA's subject matter experts, they agreed that the $950 million was off base, but the fact that that additional hosting line item was not included in the $2.3 billion, um, $2 billion estimate suggests that the, the number is higher. Okay. Uh, thank you. you. And the GAO, you made a recommendation in your report. And uh, Dr. Tibbetts, I'd like to ask, will the VA concur uh, with that recommendation, and how do you put, plan to address this cost reliability issue? Uh, great, Chairwoman Lee. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our concurrence is on the way in. I, in fact, saw the signed out version a few days ago. So, yes, we intend to fully concur with the report and the recommendations. Um, I guess uh, I should introduce here the notion of the Technology Business Management Framework, TBM. Uh, TBM is the framework uh, that we're using with to um, properly categorize and classify uh, information technology costs. Uh, we're working very closely with OMB to implement that framework. Uh, our uh, uh, FY21 budget uh, in September of this year will be submitted in accordance with that TBM framework. Um, as you might well imagine, a certain maturation will go on. Uh, the first implementation of that might require additional refinements and enhancements later on for sure. Uh, but we intend to fully comply with that uh, TBM standard and, in so doing, address uh, the GAO uh, uh, findings and recommendations. Uh, thank you for that. I'm happy to hear that. But I, I want to know what's prevented the VA from implementing this cost methodology in the past? Uh, well, I, let me separate my answer into two parts. First of all, this cost methodology that I just mentioned is relatively new as a commercial standard. It began around 2012, and I don't remember exactly when between 2012 and now, but somewhere in there, uh, OMB decided to make it a federal standard. I don't know exactly when that happened, though, but uh, I'd say the TBM standard itself is relatively new. Uh, that's one part of my answer. The other part is, uh, fiscal discipline uh, with respect to information technology has been uh, uh, evolving over time. We're very interested in improving it all the time. We have been on a trajectory to try to improve it over time. Uh, hence, we fully agree with the GAO recommendations. Um, some of the methodology we have used, for example, on the personnel cost that uh, the GAO representative mentioned, uh, we have not up to now seen the need, I guess I would say, to uh, classify personnel costs by system. So we have personnel costs and we have system costs, but mapping personnel costs to system costs is not something we've done up to now. So uh, we will in the future, obviously, consistent with this TBM framework. But it, that's a matter of uh, those mappings and um, things that just were not considered necessarily high priority at the time. I, I can't tell you further why that was. It just is about a, I've exhausted my knowledge on the subject. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I am uh, out of my time, and I now recognize uh, Congressman Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Tibbetts, in your testimony, you seem to have adopted figures that GAO says is unreliable. $426 million to sustain VISTA for 2019 and $4.89 billion over the next 10 years, which is roughly 10 times the 2019 number. Do you stand by the VISTA cost information that VA gave to GAO? Uh, yes, it's the using the, uh, est for the parts that GAO is referring to that are unsubstantiated, we had to use uh, some form of estimation uh, methodology. Uh, we did uh, that, and uh, it is the best we can do at the time. Uh, 
up to now. Uh, that will certainly improve over the future as we uh, move further into implementation of this TVM framework. But uh, those Harris, are the best have, numbers we have at the time. Do yes. you have a response to that or anything to add to that? The number that was reported, the $2.3 billion number, was never intended to be projectable because it's not. And the $2.3 billion number is not reliable. Only $1 billion of that figure it was found to be reliable. So the, the projections that Dr. Tibbetts um, stated does not come from the GAO report. Okay, interesting. Dr. Tibbetts, the purpose of figuring out how much VISTA cost is to compare it to Cerner, but I don't, but I don't see VA making much effort to argue the EHRM is going to save money, all things considered. Is there ever going to be a business case demonstrating savings, even over the very long term, or is that just unrealistic? Well, obviously, uh, with, first of all, with respect to the TBM framework, again, certainly CERNA costs will be incorporated into that TBM framework. So from a transparency perspective, it will be included in our, all of our IT uh, reporting. Uh, that said, uh, the major motivation for going to CERNA, as I think all of you are aware of from the determination findings, is to strengthen information interoperability with the Department of Defense. So. Yes, uh, what the cost will turn out to be is very important. Uh, we certainly will um, make a great effort to uh, make that very clear to whoever needs to know what that is uh, for our own internal management purposes as well. Uh, but as I say, it's the well-being of the service member and veteran that is our principal motivation for going to CERN, not necessarily an economic argument. Okay, let's move on. Mr. Short. Um, it, has it been decided whether to keep VA's My Healthy Vet patient portal and integrate it with Cerner or adopt the Cerner patient portal, portal and integrate it with Vista in the mixed environment? Sir, at uh, initial IOC go live, we will be rolling out the Cerner patient portal, the same as DOD rolled out. While we're doing that, there's an initial enhancements going on in the patient portal for all the requirements that the Connected Care My Healthy Vet team has laid out and with our program office. In addition to that, Dr. Krupa, myself, and the Office of Connected Care are doing a review currently, and we will over the next couple months, on what's the, the, the final uh, answer to your question, and that is, will we integrate into My Healthy Vet, or will we take all that functionality and put it in the commercial platform to make sure that it's a seamless integrated view for the veteran. Either way that goes, it will be integrated into the VA.gov portal so all the veterans can go to one place, have one experience to access their health care. Okay, so Dr. O'Toole, is VHA confident that the Cerner patient portal can integrate with VISTA in all respects and meet your needs? The driving force for all of this is to ensure, particularly during IOC Block 1 and Block 2 implementations, that the local facilities and local facility leadership and frontline providers are going to be comfortable with the interface with Cerner and that frontline clinicians will feel confident that patient safety will not be compromised. And that is really our driving force. Uh, to date and through the workshop processes and through the local workshop efforts, um, all indications are that the uh, patient safety and patient care um, will not be compromised and will be done efficiently, but this is something that we are monitoring closely and this is something that clearly is of highest priority moving forward. With okay, the so uh, Mr. Short, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the firm. Um, it still has not been established. When is this supposed to happen and given the continued delay, how has the timeline for it to evolve into its various stages of operating capability changed? Sir, I can tell you that there's uh, continual meetings on a weekly basis with DOD and VA. There may be a, a week or two here and there because of schedules that they did not meet, but routinely they meet on a regular basis and they're continuing to make progress. I know that some of the dates and announcements haven't come that the uh, Hill has requested. I'll have to take that question for the record. I don't have any new dates. Okay, my time has expired. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Mr. Lamb for five minutes. Um, Dr. Tibbetts, I think it's a little hard for veterans in particular to understand how we're going to spend $5 billion over 10 years on a legacy system that we're trying to replace when the cost of the, the new system is $10 billion. I mean, essentially, we're spending half of, of what we're doing on the new system to just maintain the old one, and that may not even represent all the costs. So 
can you explain to me how I can explain to veterans in my community what what are the drivers of that cost to maintain and, and upgrade and sustain Vista over the next decade? What what is making us spend the bulk of that five billion? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Thank you for your question. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, well, first of all, uh, I think uh, everyone understands, and we've had this, uh, I think, out there um, um, for broad-based understanding, the complexity of VISTA itself due to its age. And um, that complexity drives costs. So uh, understanding the interconnections, in, in understanding and dealing with the connect interconnections inside of VISTA, understanding what um, uh, to put a new capability into VISTA, understanding break-fix work in VISTA is complicated. Uh, however, to your point, uh, that, that high maintenance cost, if you, if you will, is part of the concern of what led us to the conclusion on top of the information interoperability, which was our primary reason, but getting out of the complexity uh, and cost uh, uh, driven by that complexity is part of the reason why we wanted to move out of VISTA. That said, it's a 10-year period. Uh, we have to account for time to uh, learn lessons as we go through this implementation process. And at the same time, as uh, you recognize, uh, we have to continue to deliver quality care to veterans at the sites that have not yet received. But I guess, term. are there any particular tasks or contractors that drive that $5 billion cost more than other? I mean, it's one thing to say it's complex. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand that. But why? how does it end up being $5 billion? It just seems like so much. Well, that's not dramatically different in any way than our past experience. And I would say, no, there's not any particular one contractor. The, the, the answer to the veterans question that you asked me is to maintain quality service for those veterans at the places that haven't received CERN. That's the bottom line answer to a veteran. But uh, no, it's not one particular contractor. It's the overall complexity. We have a network, a mosaic of contractors that are supporting uh, VISTA, keeping it up and running. And uh, we, I, I guess I should hasten to add here, however, <clears throat> our migration to the cloud uh, for Vista, we are anticipating uh, cost savings from that migration to the cloud, which the first instance we have now successfully completed. So we believe that uh, the remaining will be equally um, efficient and effective uh, migration. That will serve to keep the ongoing maintenance cost under control, I guess I can say. Okay. Ms. Harris, is this, I know this is an issue you've, you've stayed with for a long time, the the EHR implementation and everything. Um, was this foreseen 5, 10, 15 years ago, whenever? Did, did we understand in the past what we were spending on VISTA, and was that used as an argument that maybe we should have started this whole replacement earlier? Can you give me a little bit of history on that? Well, with regards to VISTA, I mean, even at this time right now, um, VA is unable to draw a circle around it. And, I mean, and that... That is something that has persisted over the, you know, the past ten, you know, since since the inception of Vista, because of the decentralized nature of how Vista was developed, and as a result of that decentralization, which began in the '80s, um, there is uh, VA is not in a position to be able to um, at least effectively draw that circle and that that perimeter around what is and isn't Vista, and as a result, they are unable to accurately report the annual development and sustainment costs. So because of that lack of, I guess, management in the beginning where um, there was a disciplined approach to understanding and documenting the physical and performance characteristics of the system, um, that is why they are in the position that they are in at this time. And the inability to be able to draw that perimeter is why they don't have accurate costs and why at this time they, they don't have an accurate basis for an ROI um, as to, you know, for moving to the server system. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. I will uh, now ask a few more questions. I wanted to uh, follow up with Ms. Harris. Um, uh, this TBM methodology that uh, Dr. Tibbetts um, discussed, do you uh, believe that this approach will be sufficient? Um, I, I do not believe so. Until VA... Um, can fully define VISTA, they will not be in a position to be able to accurately report the costs. I think the two go hand in hand, and the definition of VISTA is foundational. So whether they use TBM or another type of methodology, 
um, it, the the core issue remains that the 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 definition of Vista is not fully defined, and that's the problem. And can you be a little more specific when you basically, you know, it sounds like just defining the nature of the beast is the the real issue here. Um, can uh, just improving that accuracy, what do you foresee needs to be done? Understanding the 130 versions of VISTA, the performance characteristics, as well as the environment in which um, those instances of, of VISTA are operating. So having those clearly detailed and defined, adequately defined, is, is critical. So that's what I mean. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tibbetts, um, you have a plan to transition into the Cerner, um, but also continuing to support um, VISTA. Why is the, you're making this plan for the transition, but after you've already begun the implementation? Why is that? Uh, I, well, I would say right now what we're doing, and I'll, I'll ask uh, John Shaw to elaborate in a moment, uh, but uh, actually the thinking and planning, planning uh, for that transition began long ago when uh, the determination and findings was written and the department decided to go in this direction for a lot of reasons, which I'll skip over right now, but the principal one being information interoperability for the uh, benefit of service members and veterans. Um, so the planning itself began. What 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 the what I O C the uh, the proximity to the uh, initial operating capability as we get closer and closer to that interact more and more with uh, Cerner itself uh, with the healthcare professionals in uh, VHA. We're learning more as we go along. We have demonstrations. You've heard already about the workshops. We've had uh, six of them already. So. Uh, those are intensive interactions with respect to understanding clinical workflows and all, that, so all, all those things, data migration, et cetera. All that's going to go into this, the actual documented plan. So there's a lot of learning that has had to happen in order to actually put a pen to paper on a document called a planning, but on, called a plan, a pivot. We call it a pivot plan. But the, uh, the, the, the process of thinking and, and, and gathering the information to do that has, has been going on for several years already. Uh, during this entire ramp up, uh, um, leading to up to uh, the award decision, the award, and now the interactions with Cerner. Yeah, I guess you know my concern is looking at all of the costs. Like we have a cost estimate that that Cerner is going to cost ten billion dollars. You have a cost estimate of four point eight billion to maintain Vista. We don't have any confidence a in what Vista actually entails. So I don't think we have any confidence in that $4.8 billion. But then more importantly, that makes me have less confidence in the $10 billion estimate for Cerner as well. And at what point do we sit down and really lay out exactly what this is going to cost? I mean, you know, money does not grow on trees. And so at what point do we lay out exactly what the costs are. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think, as uh, Ms. Harris pointed out earlier, uh, uh, we're part of this learning process. You mentioned, uh, I think, the on site surveys that are done uh, in anticipation of the CERNA rollout that call current state reviews. So uh, as those current state reviews happen, uh, certainly in a very definitive way, we will understand everything about VISTA interfaces and everything else at that site in anticipation of CERNA being implemented at that site. So uh, as the waves ro ro roll forward, we will, be, be, we will become more and more definitive about the cost estimates that we, that we have to live with now. So. So um, uh, that process is ongoing. We have conducted, as the GAO pointed out, we have conducted that process already at the first three sites. Um, we're very confident uh, that that process is going to yield very complete information based on the actual experience we have with it to date. Thank you. I'm out of my time, and I'll now recognize Ranking Member Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Short, please give us an update on the data migration. What what data in terms of types and magnitude do you currently plan to migrate into Cerner? 
Sir, the data we've identified was, was, was identified by the chief medical officer and her clinical staff working with VHA. All the clinically relevant data, uh, which includes 73 billion records, let me explain what a record is. So it's an a, a encounter note, a lab report, a vital sign. Each one of those is an individual record in VISTA. So initially, the initial load from VA to Cerner is 77 billion of those records. Uh, the oldest one is back from the early 80s, a lab report, and we can give you more details on that for the record if you'd like. Uh, of those comes up 21 different clinical domains that were identified by VHA in the CMO office. Those records uh, went from uh, VA to the Kansas City Data Center into a, a data repository in preparation to loading into the Cerner Healthy Intent platform. So over the next 30 days, it is intended to move that data into the Healthy Intent platform. When we go live at a site, uh, as the current plans for March 2020, the initial set of data domains that would be available would be 10 of those 21 inside the EHR itself. But all 21 clinical domains will be available to the clinicians and other caregivers, MVBA as needed, in the Healthy Intent Viewer. So they'll have the long record, the all records available from DOD and VA that are in Healthy Intent. They'll be see, able to see all those in the Healthy Intent Viewer. And the initial clinically relevant records that they prioritize for go live will be in the EHR. So will all of this patient data be accessible in Millennium? Or will a user need to look in another system such as Healthy Intent? Uh, the CMO office in VHA has determined some of the domains they don't want in Millennium. Um, the initial set of, of data that will go in Millennium is 10 data domains. Uh, within uh, five to eight months after we go live, we will add additional data domains so at that point, uh, 18 of those 21, the most clinically relevant ones that they want in Millennium, will be in there. Uh, additionally, they've identified to have three years of records as the baseline that they want in there. For different purposes and reasons, that's the baseline they determine in the brief to the uh, Undersecretary of Health Office. And so that way, all those records will be in Millennium to trigger uh, clinical decision support and other information. However, if they need to pull in additional data further back, they can do that or they can just view it in healthy intent. Okay. How many of the VISTA to Cerner interfaces have been completed now, and when is the deadline to complete all of them? My, my understanding is that this deadline has come uh, sometime before the go-live deadline. Uh, sir, there's 73 uh, go-live minimum uh, interface system interfaces required. Uh, of those, uh, there are a number of, of the interfaces that uh, were already completed that we're reusing uh, from DOD and another, a number of them from uh, commercial. So 12 of those system interfaces were already developed for DOD. So except for the testing end-to-end -end for VA use uh, from the user level, those are complete. Uh, additionally, there's 25 uh, interfaces that are commercial system interfaces that they're going to be able to reuse and so, except for the testing and the validation by the user, those are already complete because they're reusing those. Okay. What's the deadline to determine which Vista modules get replaced by which Cerner software packages or other companies' software, right. and which Vista modules have you yet to determine a plan for? So all the clinical Vista modules, with the exception of prosthetics, uh, will, will be replaced by the Cerner platform between the initial go-live and the IOC period. At the initial go-live, the different modules that will be either integrated versus uh, replaced is being determined over the next two weeks. Dr. Krupa, the CMO for OHRM, is meeting with uh, Spokane and Puget Sound functional staff and facility directors to go over the 313 Cerner capabilities and validating which ones they'll have at go live. And that, at that point, we'll know whether it be two or five modules of VISTA we'll still integrate with. But by the end of the ISC exit, it'll be either one or no VISTA modules clinically relevant that we'll use. All right, D Dr. O'Toole, really quick, what is VHA's expectation for the CERNA data from the early sites coming back into VISTA at the later sites? In other words, how seamless should the view of patient data be for VISTA users in the mixed environment? The expectation is that um, it is possible that one will need to use multiple systems in the context of a clinical encounter, whether it's looking at past chest X-rays to determine, you know, uh, how things looked previously, 
um, or, or other clinical examples of that sort. The challenge for us, though, is to ensure that it can be done efficiently, whether it's going to the joint legacy view or other mechanisms or being able to look at the Cerner interface. This is what the Spokane and Seattle IOC visits are going to be looking at within this context of specific clinical scenarios and clinical needs um, to be able to determine if it could be done efficiently and timely. And if it can, then we will be, and it's sanctioned and agreed to by local leadership and frontline providers, then it will be proceeding. But the expectation is that there will be cl clinical scenarios where both interfaces are going to be needed. All right, my time has expired. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize Mr. Watkins for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Harris, uh, your testimony indicates the VA could not give you accurate numbers as to the cost to maintain VISTA because uh, there's not an accurate me or adequate methodology to determine the costs belonging, uh, uh, what costs belong to VISTA. What kind of methodology does the VA need and how is it going to be developed? Mr. Watkins, thank you for the question. So the, the finding that we had was that VA lacks a documented methodology for, for accounting for what is and isn't VISTA. Um, we, we don't have any recommendations or uh, r related to the type of methodology that is necessary. Um, but what is most important is that whatever process that they choose, that it's documented um, and vetted throughout the organization. Okay, thanks. Dr. Tibbetts, where are you in the process of developing this methodology? Yes, uh, as I said earlier, we completely agree with the uh, GAO report and the, and, uh, the representative's current remarks. Um, <clears throat> I did mention earlier TBM, and in, in, as indicated in the prior discussion, TBM is only part, the te technology business management framework is only part of the answer. The definitional boundary of CHS is clearly an important part of the answer as well. Uh, the two of those combined together is what's going to wind up with uh, being our methodology. I would say uh, in our response to GAO, uh, we have indicated that I think at the next update, I believe that's 120 days from now, we will have a final answer as to what that methodology will be. Thank you, Dr. Tibbetts. Your testimony references a pilot program to move VISTA data to the cloud. Apparently, this has already been successfully accomplished at one location. What is the scope of this pilot program? How much VISTA data are you considering eventually moving to the cloud? Uh, so uh, let me be clear, it's not just VISTA data, we're moving VISTA uh, in its entirety. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the ultimate scope or uh, whatever instances of VISTA remain um, uh, operational as the Cerner uh, platform rolls out. So. As things stand today, it would be the scope would be 130 instances, but by the time we get Vista actually moved and Cerner rolled out, it's probably going to be a smaller number than that. The, the initial wave uh, we're envisioning right now is 70, 7070, uh, because of their current location in a DoD facility, which is closing. Uh, we have to make sure we get those initial 70 moved first because there's a date certain by which that facility will close. How, how long and how much will it cost to move all 130? I will have to get back to you on the exact cost figures. Uh, and we do have a schedule, um, again, driven by the DISA data center closure. Um, I just happen not to remember that date right now. I'll be happy to get that back to you. But uh, the, the, the schedule for that first 70 is absolutely fixed because of that closure date by DISA. So I got to yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hume, we've heard that uh, from the VA on multiple occasions that Cerner's Millennium will only replace 60% of VISTA's capabilities or functionality, um, and then that the EHR may have to link back to VISTA to fulfill the other 40%. Can you address what functions make up this other 40%? Uh, yes, ma'am. The, the bulk of those other functionalities are being replaced by other modernization systems, the financial management modernization system, and the supply chain modernization with the defense metal logistics standard support system. Um, I, I'll defer to, to Mr. Short for the details, but there's a small percentage of capabilities beyond that uh, that are not being replaced by one of those three modernization systems, and we're in the process of identifying this, the solution to that. It may be 
uh, uh, a interface to Vista for some time, a replacement by a commercial product. We, ha we have yet to work that out. Mr. Shark, do you want to comment? Y yes, uh, thank you. Ma'am, uh, initially at IOC Go Live, five to seven of the Vista clinical modules will be interfaced to. By the IOC exit, the plan is to only have a dependency on one Vista module being prosthetics, and the solution for that, Cerner's developing different additional clinical content and some IP development uh, to make sure that all the nuances of prosthetics that VA has can be added to their platform, uh, which will be beneficial to anyone else using that platform as well. The other portions of Vista, the other 40%, uh, a large portion of that are base core functionalities of Vista, have nothing to do with any functionality at all, like a XML parser, you know, like to be able to split out data. That's something that only if you need to use a system is that capability necessary, like an operating system is only important for a, an application. So those things go away when the, when the application functionality goes away. The other items, Doctor, I mean, Mr. Hume mentioned, are business systems, uh, accounting, uh, acquisitions, tracking, and not medical related, but tied into healthcare. Uh, so uh, just thinking about the cost, so you have these other capabilities. I, you have plans to modernize or replace those capabilities. Is the co who's where's that cost coming from? Is that included in the ten billion that we have planned for Cerner? Is that outside of it? Is that part of the four point eight nine billion projected for Vista? Where where are those costs coming from? Uh, well, uh, Madam Chair, if I understand your question correctly, uh, with respect to the the, the major efforts. Uh, that uh, address the 40 percent FM uh, financial management business transformation. That's our ERP replacement, and Dimmels, which is our supply chain mod modernization. They have their own cost boundaries and, and cost uh, definitions. So that would not be part of the Vista so boundary no. or the Cerner boundary. No, they're those are all. But it's complement. not included in your four your five billion dollars to Correct. maintain Vista. So this is we have another cost on top of that to take care of these four, this 40 percent. Right. Those are programs of record and uh, uh, have been in our budget submission now for a few years. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, ERP replacement, FMBT, and DIMLs, yes, those are separate programs already included in our budget submissions. Okay. Uh, so just a question, will then, will Cerner be responsible for uh, addressing any of this 40 percent, or is this all being taken care of? No, the, the 40 percent are the other systems. The other so stuff. that's FMBT, uh, sorry, financial management, business transformation, DIMLs, and then the remaining things that uh, John Short has talked about, which might actually no longer be needed at all, some technical things, X, XML parser and whatnot. So, no, the Cerner is the 60 percent part of the okay. question. All right. Um, so at Go Live, how's the VA going to address um, these cap capabilities in Cerner that are not going to meet clinical needs, such as prosthetics, and where there's no alternative product? Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, perhaps uh, Chuck Hume uh, to comment on that in a minute. Uh, uh, the prosthetics community, of course, is working very intensively with us. I've personally sat in on many of those meetings. Uh, I think the short-term uh, um, approach, if I can say that, is to maintain a prosthetic system and build an interface over to that prosthetic system until uh, such time as uh, that functionality is adequately de uh, developed and represented in the Cerner product itself. So as I think all of you are well aware of, prosthetics is a very well-developed, very sophisticated capability at the VA, uh, not something that uh, Cerner necessarily encounters to that extent in, the, in their commercial uh, practice. And uh, so not surprising to us that they have to beef up that capability. But in the meantime, I believe our short-term answer is to maintain our prosthetic system and interface that as necessary. Could you? Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Ranking Member Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. O'Toole, I want to make sure that I understand the data migration answer that we discussed a little bit ago. Are you saying that the VHA physicians don't want all patient data to be in Millennium? Uh, no, sir. I'm not 
saying that. Uh, I think the issue is some as we roll out, and obviously with the staggered rollout across sites, and for veterans who may be migrating across systems, there may be instances where data may not initially be available um, on the Cerner platform, but it is available on the legacy platform, particularly longitudinal data going back. And from a clinical perspective, in seeing a patient where having that longitudinal history is going to be necessary to provide their care, it's going to be important to be able to have access to both the legacy systems as well as the current systems of care. Um, so it's not so matter of um, uh, an issue of preference, it's a matter of issue of, of practicality and, and, and good care. Okay. Mr. Hume and Mr. Short, um, how many other technology projects in VA have dependencies with EHRM? And can you list them if you can and tell me who is responsible for each set of dependencies? Well, the predominant uh, systems would be those we talked about, the financial management modernization and the supply chain modernization, each of those programs. Uh, um, the the in immediate um, uh, relationship is with the, the supply chain modernization, the defense medical logistics support system. That system is to roll out to uh, the sites that are modernizing to Cerner uh, four months in advance of that so that we can make sure that those interfaces um, are, are functioning. Um, we're fortunate that we're adopting the defense medical logistics support system, which they have already interfaced with Cerner as part of their rollout under MHS Genesis. Mr. Short, do you want to add anything? Uh, the two programs Mr. Hume mentioned, Terry Riffle and uh, Harry Oldland, are the two people, the first one FMBT and second one the Demos, that are the uh, SES executives over those programs. Uh, so both those programs have a dependency on some of our functionality and OHRM has a uh, dependency on theirs. OHRM also has a dependency on the Joint Legacy Viewer during the transition period because there's some functionality that for some workarounds until all capabilities are released and tested and validated that they'll need to use the Joint Legacy Viewer at the transitional sites. Um, there are some ancillary systems that we have some dependencies on and we can take that for the record and document that for you. Okay, um, Mr. Short, I wrote, a, I wrote the Secretary a letter last month about patient matching. As you know, it is, a, it is key to quality and interoperability. I appreciate the thorough response, uh, but I would like you to explain one of the statements. It says, quote, a single EHR solution between VA and DOD will guarantee 100% patient matching within the new EHR solution for service members and veterans, end quote. Does that pertain to VA and DOD or VA and the Mission Act providers? Um, sir, I'm not sure if it pertains to the Mission Act providers. Uh, I would believe it pertains to the first, DOD and VA. I can get back for the record on the second question. Um, to, to, to answer part of that question, the joint patient identity management service that we've developed with DOD and we've tested out, uh, what we've used to make sure that we have maintainability, when you have a single EHR, with an overlapping customer base, as you can imagine, DOD, MVA, and beneficiaries, and veterans, service members can go back and forth. Active duty members are seen at VA hospitals at times, et cetera. Uh, you could have a mismatch if you had different identity systems saying, no, this is John Short, or that's John Short. And so by having one system with everything worked out in the background, make, maintains, we do that. Um, but for the record, on the other part of your question, I'll take that back. Okay. Um, Last question. What is VA's, Mr. Short, for you as well, what is VA's goal for patient matching with the Mission Act providers in Cerner, and how are you going to achieve it? Uh, our, our goal is to be a complete patient matching to ensure that everything is completely uh, safe, accurate for every patient, that the veterans that deserve care get the care, and they get the right care and the right prescriptions. Uh, so for the record, I can take it back on their, our plans. I don't have that with me today. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Dr. T Dr. Tibbetts, um, there's many entities outside of VA using VISTA that uh, have agreements like OSERA and uh, uh, World VISTA. This committee's heard from several of these groups with concerns about the future of their access to VISTA code and possible future innovations. And I wanted to ask you, how was the VA 
leveraging <clears throat> outside experience through these groups uh, to further the instances of VISTA? Uh, well, <clears throat> as we mentioned earlier, first of all, uh, maintaining VISTA over the 10-year rollout period of CERN is very important to us, critical to veteran yeah. care. So we're going to continue to focus on uh, doing that. Um, I can say that in the past, from the open source community, we have certainly uh, uh, obtained a very valuable um, contribution to FileMan, which is the underlying database in VISTA. Um, how that relation, so there have, there have been additions, and, and actually that FileMan upgrade was a substantial one, uh, not some minor tweaks from the open source community. Um, how that will play out in the future, I am not sure I know enough to exactly tell you that yet, uh, other than, other than we, we will continue to maintain VISTA for the rollout period. Number two, we will continue to um, make available whatever the VISTA code is at that point in time to those communities. That We have no reason to stop any of that. Um, since there is a 10-year rollout period and since the rollout, rollout process is geographic, not functional, uh, the additional functionality and patching will have to continue for the majority of that 10 years until the last site gets turned off. So <clears throat> with respect to those outside entities that are using VISTA, they certainly have plenty of time to prepare for what what might eventually happen uh, 10 years from now. It's not going to be a surprise to them uh, Do you in have any way. Agreement? Do you have a license? Do you have any licensing agreements with those groups? And does that, is there like a stop date at 10 years? Uh, licensing, I, I think I'm going to, we would be best advised to take that for the record. Licensing is very complicated. Um, when you get into Apache 2 licenses and uh, commons and all that sort of stuff. So um, uh, OSERA is quite expert at license management. Uh, I think we should take that for the record and get back to you on the license questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. O'Toole, while the VA is using the electronic, the dual records, um, what clinical impacts are expected and tolerated and which ones would be unacceptable? Thank you. It's um it's a, an extremely important issue and, and challenge for us. I think the um, expectation is that uh, there will be workflows that require uh, dual system use for different clinic scenarios. The challenge point and the things that we are going to be looking for are, one, clearly how will that impact um, in terms of efficiency of patient care and the amount of time that it takes uh, to care for a patient in, within those clinical settings. The expectation with the initial IOC rollout sites is that uh, clinical time needs to be expend, extended for each clinical visit to ensure that adequate time is, is made available. Uh, we're in the process of expanding the traveling nursing core at our IOC sites to enhance the staff, um, uh, staff capabilities there um, in order to ensure that. The biggest challenges and the big, biggest risks to us, I think, are really related to complex clinical scenarios where patients may be migrating across multiple settings or where longitudinal care is critical to clinical decision making. And that is something that we are in the process of looking at very closely within the context of the IOC capabilities um, to ensure that those workflow processes are identified in advance, that clinicians up front know what to expect and what the workflow processes will be. Um, but it is something we will be monitoring and watching very closely through this process. Thank you. Uh, just one last question. Um, Ms. Harris, there, obviously there's a lot of uncertainties in the uh, potential solutions that we hear, we're hearing today. and. From a management um, perspective, do you have concerns and is the VA taking on, on risk that it may not be aware of in your opinion? Well, we have ongoing work for the subcommittee related to the transition plans and activities that are underway. Um, I, I think that having having effective plans is, is a very critical thing and having plans that are at the, the right level of detail is certainly uh, very critical. Um, I think that one of the things that we we have some questions about at this time relates to the clinical workflows um, and and 
when that will be completed and the level of granularity of those workflows in time for the IOC deployment. Uh, that's the, the timing of those two activities is something that, that we have some questions on and, and whether the, the, the VA will be in a position to be able to complete those workflows um, in time for the deployments at those IOC sites. That, that's something that we have some questions about at this time. Thank you. Good. Well, this uh, now concludes the uh, subcommittee hearing. I wanted to thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Uh, thank Ms. Harris for your report. Um, we are heartened that, that the VA will take the recommendation of the GAO and has uh, begun implementing the methodology, and we look forward to having transparent updates uh, as we go along. Um, from my point of view, um, you know, continuing uh, Mr. Short, uh, lack of uh, plan on joint governance continues to be a problem with the rollout of uh, this program um, and our lack of having knowledge of what the plans are, when we can expect to see a joint governance um, really continues to concern us. And it's really mostly for me about the risk of the rollout in this contract. I mean, this was a fixed price contract. Uh, VA uh, implemented it with indefinite deliverable, indefinite quality, which really would have shifted a lot of the risk onto the contractor. But with lack of knowledge of really what the extent of VISTA is, um, to me, shifts a lot of that risk back onto the VA. And when we start to talk about the cost, you know, the billions and billions of dollars of cost of this project, I, I just have concern and I hope that we can continue to have some transparency as we roll out. And when we get to specific decision points to be able to stand up and make the proper decision based on uh, the status of where we are at the time would be my hope as, as we move forward. Uh, especially giving, given the track record that we've had in trying to update VISTA multiple times in the past. Um, and ultimately, you know, improved health care for our veterans is really the focus that we all, and I know Dr. O'Toole, we are all focused on. And uh, obviously the interoperability being uh, the number one um, objective in this rollout. And so... Uh, as we move forward, again, we thank you all for being here and continue to want to have that transparency so we can make sure that ultimately we're delivering the best care uh, possible uh, to veterans in our country. And thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses. I hope uh, that we'll work together with this uh, subcommittee as we continue this oversight. All members will have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. And this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>